are the Celts? Or possibly who were the Celts? Now, those are tricky questions, and to provide some answers, we are delighted and honored to welcome Professor Barry Cunliffe from the University of Oxford. Hello, Professor. Thank you so much for being with us today. Let's start with a provocative question, shall we? Did the Celts actually exist? And first of all, what do we mean by Celts? The word Celt can mean more or less anything to anybody. It's uh, one of those general purpose words that is used sometimes correctly and sometimes very incorrectly. I think it's wrong to talk about, for example, a Celtic nation or a great Celtic civilization. That's a wrong concept. But there were people called Celts is absolutely right. And we know this because of the classical writers describing their neighbors in barbarian Europe. Julius Caesar actually says about the Gauls, we call them Gauls, they call themselves Celts. So there's evidence that the Celts existed. And then before Caesar, classical writers recording what was going on in the barbarian world. Herodotus, for example, talks about Celts in Europe. He says that the Celts extend into Spain to the Atlantic. Uh, Epirus, another Greek writer, says that there were only two great peoples in Europe, the Scythians and the Celts. And the Celts were so extensive that they spread right over beyond Cadiz, over to the Atlantic again. And then, of course, we get the these wonderful descriptions of Celtic war bands from eastern France, southern Germany, north of the Alps, beginning to impinge upon the classical world. They move down into the Po Valley, some of them, and then from the Po Valley through the Apennines and attack Rome. Another group of these Celts, these warriors, moves along the Danube into the Balkans and attacks Delphi in Greece, and then some of those move on into Anatolia, into what is now Turkey. So these people are called Celts by the classical writers. They act as cohesive groups and the archaeology we can associate with them suggests that they're sharing a culture. So to that extent, I think we can reasonably talk about there being Celts in Europe. If we ask when these people were actually being called Celts, the earliest evidence we've got is of Hecateus, a Greek writer, who's writing in the 6th century BC. And then from then on, right up to the time of Caesar, people are writing about Celts. There are no references to Celts before the 6th century. After that, it gets a bit more difficult because then people are beginning to reinterpret the world through classical writing. So people start to use the word Celt more and more loosely. So I think we can't really say that there were distinctive people who were called Celts and who called themselves Celts much after the time of Caesar. So we're talking about the continental Celts, the Celts from continental Europe. What do you think about the concept of insular Celts, Celts from Britain and Ireland in ancient times? And that, that's a reasonable question. No classical writer has ever referred to anyone in Britain and Ireland as a Celt. The earliest reference that gives a name to the British is by a Greek called Pythias, who in about 320 BC actually sailed around Britain and wrote a book on the subject. And he talks about them as the Pretani, from which we get Britons. And it means essentially the painted ones. It doesn't sound like the name they would call themselves. It's much more the name that their neighbours would have called them. So we don't know that there were definitely Celts in Britain. But what we do know is that the continental Celts spoke a form of Celtic which is very similar to the form of Celtic spoken in at least England and Wales, but not over in Ireland or in Scotland. They were speaking the same language. They were sharing elements of the same culture as well. And there is some genetic evidence that suggests some intermixing going on. So I think it's fair to say that peoples of southeastern Britain and the continent were were very much in contact with each other throughout much of prehistory. So if I understand you properly, there never was a Celtic world in the political sense of the term. However, do you believe that there were important connections between the different Celtic peoples? If we take Caesar's description of the bit of France between the Garonne and the Seine, or the Seine and the Rhine, people there, he said, called themselves Celts. But we also know from Caesar and from coin evidence and other evidence that there were many, many, many tribes there. This general mass of people who 
could be called Celts, were made up of many tribes. And those tribes had different social systems, systems of leadership. They had different economies. They had, to some extent, different archaeologists as well. So the question would be then, would someone, let us say in Brittany, recognize themselves as being part of exactly the same Celtic ethnic group as someone in Burgundy? I don't know the answer to that. Probably they would, because they were probably speaking much the same language. Then you ask the question, okay, did these people in Gaul, if they met with the Celts who had moved over into Anatolia, into Turkey, would they recognize them as relatives? We recognize them as Celts through the classical evidence and through a little bit of the archaeological evidence, but would they have recognized themselves? So I think the answer to your question is that many of these people would have come together in confederacies, and there were a number of tribes moving together as groups. So there would be bonding between these peoples. And the fact that the classical world saw them as other, they were different, they were barbarians, would help them see themselves as something different from the classical world. So it's a matter of different levels of perception. It's, it's something very difficult to get at archaeologically or historically. Well, you, you just mentioned the classical writers and, uh, well, my question would be, do you feel like their testimonies are reliable? And if we cannot trust them, what other pieces of evidence can we use to know more about the Celts? Okay, can we trust the, the classical writers? Um, to a limited extent, I think. People will describe other people in exaggerated ways to distinguish themselves from the other people. So the things the classical writers choose to tell us about Celts are the oddities that will make their readers laugh. You know, they're drunk, they fall about drunk, they don't like getting fat, and, and things like this. The things that are not very important. What they tell us specifically about the tribes that were impinging upon the Mediterranean world is okay. It's the ones who are moving down and attacking Rome are moving and attacking Greece. Here it's much more like first-hand descriptions and I think we can accept some of that information. But it is dreadfully limited. And so too is the linguistic evidence. The linguistic evidence is extremely limited and is being reinterpreted the whole time. The only new evidence we're getting all the time is from archaeology and from genetics. So okay, let's start with archaeology then, what do archaeological artifacts tell us about the Celtic population? Could you give us specific examples of what archaeology brings us and tells us about the Celts? Archaeology gives us a great deal of knowledge of particularly the way of life of and we can compare and contrast their different economies, their different art styles, to some extent the different social structures. If we take belief systems, for example, one of the classical writers says that they believed in an afterlife and that they would meet up with their friends in an afterlife. The archaeology does support that in that artifacts for the afterlife are being buried with people. But that's a generalization that could be relevant anywhere in the world at more or less any time. It's not as specific to the Celtic. So you can latch on some classical historical descriptions with the archaeology, but they're not decisive in terms of defining Celt. When you get on to art styles, I think what has for a long while been called Celtic art, this wonderful art which one finds usually on metalwork and on pottery, of flowing designs, tendrils growing out of each other, wonderful energetic abstract art. That is very distinct and um, can begin to recognize certain schools of craftsmanship in different parts of Europe. So if a style is exchanged and used and reinterpreted, it suggests some area of common acceptance and common belief. And I think it's something like that that helps us to understand, certainly when we're in, in the fourth and third centuries, where this group of people came from and um, where they went to. We can use objects decorated with Celtic art um, to help us understand movements. Weapons were broadly similar throughout Central Middle Europe and Western Europe. Um, the same sorts of shield types, the same sorts of sword types. A very good example of this is the elongated shield that sort of covers the body and it is held with the left hand with a grasp, probably made of wood and leather and wicker work for most people, but occasionally covered with bronze and decorated for the elite. And um, these do survive. So we get shields of this kind found in the River Thames in London. We get shields of this kind actually shown on the Pergamon reliefs in, in Anatolia, where there were Celtic groups 
fighting with Celtic weapons. So one can see a similarity of weapon types in the areas where the classical writers tell us the Celts were active. So that, that's archaeology. Let's move on to another field, genetics. Uh, what did genetics bring to the study of the Celts in recent years? What do you think of this science and its contribution to our understanding of the Celts? Ancient genetics is very much in its infancy. Not the technique, the technique is there, but there aren't enough samples yet available to make really precise statements. There are enough samples to give us very interesting pictures about what was probably happening. If I can take one example, the old view was very much that there were migrations from Gaul into Britain and that the Celts came with those migrations, Celtic art came with those migrations and so on and that they took place in the Iron Age, so somewhere after 800 BC. Now, the Harvard lab have recently analyzed a large number of samples of bodies from Britain and from Gaul. And um, what they've shown is conclusively that there were no significant invasions after 1000 BC into Britain. So any model that we had in the past that saw hordes of people, Celts, pouring into Britain after 1000 BC are wrong. Now, no way could the linguist tell us that. No way could the archaeologist tell us that. It's only the ancient DNA that can give us that sort of firm assurance. Now, what it does show, on the other hand, is that there was a time from about 1400 BC to about 1000 BC when there were very close similarities between the genetics of people living in northern France and the people living in southern Britain. And that's the time when there are archaeological similarities. And the simplest way of interpreting this is that there was an exchange of population, people intermarrying on both sides of the channel and developing a very similar culture. This was recognized first by French and Dutch and British archaeologists as long ago as 50 years ago. But now here is the genetic evidence which shows that this is actually a fact genetically. And it gives us quite a lot of detail. So this is going to be incredibly powerful for us once we get a lot more samples. Since the beginning of Celtic studies, several theories have been put forward regarding the arrival of the Celts in Europe and their extension. Basically, where do the Celts come from, according to science? Let's just think about this historically. The first person to write about this was a Frenchman called Paul-Yves Pezeron, who was a priest, writing at the end of the 17th century. And he came up with this idea that the Celts came from the east, that they were descended from Noah, and they moved across Europe, and they fought the Greeks, and they fought the Romans, and then they ended up in, in Brittany and so on, his homeland. And uh, this was the great movement of the Celts from the east to the west. And then that was extended by people like Edward Fluid, the Welsh linguist, who built on it and said, yes, we can recognize this in the Celtic languages. It was modified as archaeology started adding evidence to the whole debate. So the situation about 1960s, when I first studied archaeology, was that the Celts emerged in Central Europe, in what we call West Central Europe, Eastern France, Southern Germany, and that's where the language emerged, and that was from where the Celts spread out. And as part of that, the idea of Celtic spreading to Spain and Celtic spreading to Britain. Now, when archaeologists began to look at this seriously from the 1960s onwards, they said, hang on, this doesn't work. You know, part of it's OK. You know, the bit that there were Celtic raids down into Italy and Greece and so on, fine. But there is no evidence really for movement down into Spain or really for movement into Britain. So something's wrong here. And that's when some of us began to ask other questions and simply say, can we think of an alternative? Some of us were very impressed by what was going on on the Atlantic. We could see through the archaeological evidence that the Atlantic facade of Europe was a very creative place from the Neolithic period onwards. And people were moving along the Atlantic facade, and moving along the rivers from the Atlantic into the hinterland of Europe. And um, that there was a real cultural entity there. And we were beginning to say, well, people were able to communicate ideas in this way along the whole of the Atlantic facade. They must have been able to communicate with each other. And then we began to say, well, what languages were spoken here? Look at the map of Celtic languages. What we call Celtic is very much the language of the Atlantic zone. It spreads from Spain right the way up in, into Scotland. So out of that came the idea that perhaps not the Celts, 
Celts. That's why most prehistorians have stopped talking about the Celts. But the Celtic language and the various peoples who spoke the Celtic language were of one group communicating with each other in the Atlantic zone. And it was from the Atlantic zone that the Celtic language spread into Europe. That's this sort of second view, Celtic from the West. And then um, there is another view which was built recently on the genetic evidence which notices the similarity between the genetics of northern France and southeastern Britain in the mid to late Bronze Age. And that view says perhaps we're recognising the Celts here moving from France into Britain. So not moving late, but moving in the Bronze Age. So taking Celtic language and Celtic movements way back into the Bronze Age, into totally different archaeological cultures. I think most of us now, linguists and archaeologists, would have to agree that um, the Celtic language is not an Iron Age invention. It happens in the Bronze Age or earlier. And so the question is, how far back can you take the development of that language? There are several theories then, we understand that now, regarding who the ancient Celts were and where they came from. So um, how are we supposed to choose between those different theories? And more importantly, what do you expect from science in the future so that we know who the Celts are in a better, deeper, more convincing way? What is the future of Celtic studies? It's a question we've always got to ask ourselves. How can we advance? Now, the, the linguistic evidence is of its very nature limited where you might find another odd inscription or something or a few coins with an inscription on but there's not going to be a major breakthrough there if there is a major breakthrough it might be in terms of interpreting but i don't think there are great advances are going to be made there um archaeology i would like to think that archaeology is going to answer some of the questions archaeology is going to give us huge amounts more information but much the same as we already have we're going to have more settlements more material culture more better and that might enable us to nuance our interpretations of regional groups. But that's not going to really tell us very much more about individual communities within this broader Celtic band. Where I think the advances are going to come is through ancient DNA, if we can get enough samples. And one of the big, big problems is just getting enough burials with enough decent bone in and analysing them. Now, there are plenty of labs which will do the analysis, but there seems to be a reluctance in some parts of Europe to actually give up the skeletons for analysis. So there are great slabs of Europe where we've got no data at all. So we've got to make a great push for getting analyses of all the available bones, particularly in the Bronze Age. And that is difficult because cremation was the norm for many areas, and that does put in a bit of a barrier. And it's very difficult to get bone from Brittany because of the acid soil has engulfed it all, so we don't have samples. So there will be limitations, but I think that's the advance. And I can even foresee a time when perhaps archaeological strategies will move towards trying to get more DNA evidence. We don't spend a great deal of time excavating cemeteries these days. The return isn't very great. But I can see that archaeologists with geneticists might say, well, here is an area where we really need new evidence. So archaeologists go and dig us up some more bodies so I can really see archaeology changing to suit the new direction of an advance which ancient DNA will certainly lead for a long while I think. I do have one final question which may be a bit controversial and I'm sorry, well maybe I'm not sorry but still. How do you feel about people using today the term Celt or Celtic for anything connected with Ireland or Scotland or Brittany or whatever. For example, for a lot of American people, anything that is Irish or Scottish would be Celtic. How do you feel about that? Um, sometimes I get very angry and irritated, uh, but I try and be uh, tolerant. I can understand why they do it. It's a shorthand to trying to understand something very complicated. And if it helps them begin to ask questions about Celtic and their use of Celtic, very good. But there is a lot of sloppiness in the use of the word Celtic, even among archaeologists. Most of us now try not to use the word unless we're dealing with classical data where the word is actually used. I've excavated quite a lot of Iron Age sites in Britain. I would never call them Celtic. I would only ever call them Iron Age because I can't prove that those people spoke the Celtic language. But um, I would allow people to talk about their Celtic music and their Celtic art art, their Celtic spirit. Why not? We've all got different perceptions of the world and no one perception is necessarily any better than any other. <laughs>
We are so happy we were able to make this episode. If you liked it, please, please share it. It's very important to us. Remember that science is always a work in progress. Well, that's it for me for today. Come on.